this computer. Okay, Carl, okay. you're on. Okay, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, my target today is to talk about the role of theory in strategic communication. Um, so I want to focus primarily on theory and theories and, and what roles they play. Um, but they, uh, it, in order to do that, I want to lay a little bit of foundation work. So let me, uh, um, I, I, I know that we are from different kinds of educational institutions and that there are different predictions and stuff. Um, and sometimes some, some folks run into educational experiences that are pretty formal and you're supposed to just sit and listen to lectures and stuff or readings of papers. And other times um, you get into educational settings in which you're supposed to get in and tussle and talk and disagree and including with the speaker. Um, and I'm from that latter school. So uh, feel free to speak up at any time. Um, speak uh, about whatever is on your mind. I'd like to talk about what's on your mind about these topics. Uh, I have a lot of stuff prepared, uh, but I can cut out anything we need to in order to cover what's on your mind, what's of interest to you. And I'm sincere about that. Um, you will all get a full copy of these slides from Michael. Um, so even anything that's cut out from this discussion, you'll still have a copy of. So I want to encourage you to uh, feel free <coughs> to speak up, ask questions, not just to me, but of each other, state your own positions, whatever. And I guess that to, uh, to do a discussion on STRATCOM, maybe we should start with a definition. Uh, and this is the one I use in my uh, 2018 book on STRATCOM, which some of you may have seen, the uh, uh, Strategic Communication Theory and Practice, the co-creational model. Uh, but I'd actually been using the definition for some years before that. So for me, strategic communication uh, is the information, is, is using the information that flows into an organization. That's a long way of saying research to plan and carry out communication campaigns that focus on the relationship between an organization and its public. So for me, strategic communication is always research-based. If it's not based in research, it's not strategic. Uh, and the reason for that, if you look down to the next uh, bullet, is that the definition of a strategy that is most commonly accepted, there's lots of definitions throughout history of strategies, but the, the definition of a strategy that is most commonly accepted um, is that a strategy is a plan, a plan of some kind. So we have a strategy to achieve something. We have a strategy to go somewhere. Uh, if you're going on a trip, you have a strategy for how you're going to get from where you are to where you want to be. Uh, if you're in graduate school, you have a strategy for how to get through graduate school, then what you're going to do for your career afterwards. Um, so it's the plan that's the central element uh, of strategic communication. Uh, and that's an important distinction because a lot of people think or say that they are in strategic communication. And let me pause for a moment. Am I speaking either too loud or too fast? No, you're fine. Yeah. Good for me. And Katerina hey, just came in, in case you want to say hi to Katerina. Hi. Yes, hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, how are you? Long time no see. I know. Wonderful to see you, Carl. Yeah. Um, we'll talk later, too. Um, so the, uh, uh, the focus here is on a plan. And this is a fairly important point because there, most people who think of themselves as doing strategic communication are those who are working on strategic communication plans. Um, if they're making the plan, they are doing the strategic side. If they're implementing someone else's plan, then for me, they may be working in strategic communication, but they are not actually strategic communicators because what makes us strategic is the plan. And for me, that planning has to be based on thinking about and understanding our publics. So I have what's called a public centered view. Um, and I call it a co-creational view. That Maureen and I have done a couple of pieces on over the years, but I've, I've done other things as well. Um, and I'm going to pick up on that theme as we go along. So I just wanted to, to uh, kind of lay that foundation piece. Um, the, the other foundation piece before I talk about the targets for today is um, that strategic communication is probably best thought of as like an umbrella for communication that involves all of the kinds of communication that are planned and sequential. So these are communication plans, our strategic communication. 
the biggest, uh, I'm sorry, they, we, there are a number of subfields then that make up strategic communication. For me, the biggest subfield uh, and the most important are the three you see on the screen, but then there's a bunch of others we'll get to in a minute. And these three are what I call the core subfields of strategic communication. In other words, these are the three fields that make up strategic communication as we think of it. Uh, and the biggest one of those is public relations. By biggest, I mean biggest in employment. Um, although marketing challenges in, in some countries and some, some uh, uh, areas of the world. <clears throat> PR is the biggest part. Um, and PR is about developing relationships, usually long-term. Um, and yeah, I include under PR crisis and risk communication. Some people separate them out. Um, but then they can't explain how it is they're dealing with publics and it's different than public relations. Um, the next biggest uh, uh, sub area is all of marketing communication, um, which as I say in some areas is actually a little bigger than, than PR, but usually in overall PR is bigger. Um, if, in my 2018 book, the, the, uh, uh, I put in a lot of data there about the sizes of these three fields in the US. Um, so you can see what those sizes look like here. Um, in some countries with, uh, uh, with developing economies, uh, PR tends to be what governments do and marketing tends to be what companies do. And I don't have any ways to get at those sizes uh, in those cases. The other field that is clearly a, a core field of strategic communication is health communication. And that includes all of public health, uh, health in national development, all aspects of public uh, of health. Um, and it's smaller in employment but it's probably the strongest of the, th of the three in terms of uh, using theory to guide uh, their practices and being good about creating uh, strategic plans in their campaigns. Um, so ironically, sort of the, the smaller of the three tends to be the slightly more advanced in terms of, of uh, strategy and uh, use of strategy, um, whereas PR is probably the biggest and marketing is, uh, is just very common. Uh, now, for me, um, I, I classify these three as core fields uh, within strategic communication or subfields within strategic communication because they exist only to conduct communication campaigns. So for me, a core subfield is one that exists only to, uh, I'm sorry, a core subfield of strategic communication is one that exists only to conduct communication uh, campaigns. Therefore, fields that that use communication campaigns. And there's a lot of them, right? But they don't exist just to, to do those campaigns. Those I call secondary fields, and we'll get to them in a minute. So strategic communication is made up in my mind of these three core subfields and a number of secondary fields. Um, you could easily make the argument and, and you would probably be right if you disagreed with me and, and came up with other fields that you think should be considered core subfields of strategic communication um, because they rely so heavily on communication campaigns. For instance, some of my students have made the argument that political campaigns uh, are a kind of core subfield within strategic communication. Uh, and they sort of are, this is a semantic quibble, uh, but not all of political communication is campaigns. Uh, whereas uh, for our use, uh, and you know that uh, the second biggest field I say is marketing communication, not all of marketing, because there's a lot in marketing that's not campaigns. So it's marketing communication uh, that for me is the core subfield. Uh, any okay. questions up to here or am I going too fast? Uh, well, I, April had a question. She was wondering about political communication. Yeah, okay, go ahead, April. Yeah, I think you sort of mentioned that already. I was asking, do you consider political communication also a sub secondary, you know, subfield of strategic? For me, I, I would list it as secondary. But if you wanted to make the argument that it's a core subfield or primary subfield, you could easily make that argument um, by saying that all of the, the other kinds of communication that political uh, uh, folks and political institutions engage in are designed, are, are brought about by the political campaigns in the first place and often carried out through political campaigns. So it's the next one that if someone wanted to make an argument that it's uh, a core subfield, I, you know, I wouldn't hugely object to that at all. Sure, thank you. If I may, if I may uh, 
you mentioned health communications, but but for now, uh, these principles of health communication are also used for other social communications. Like, right. for example, not 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 only against diseases, but against bad habits in uh, in I don't know driving your car, for example. Right, right. social habits and a number of other things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and when they, but when they run those campaigns, if you look at them, um, all almost all of them. Uh, could also be understood as public relations campaigns mm. um, because they identify a public, uh, they do research on that public, and then they, they run a campaign uh, to usually to be persuasive. Sometimes they call it being educational. Um, one of the problems with, with health communication practices in strategic communication is that uh, almost invariably those sponsoring health communication campaigns think they know all the answers and all they have to do is educate their publics. So health communication, although it's more advanced in theory, in use of theory, than the other fields for the other subfields, um, tends to anger a lot of people as well. Uh, and there are big divisions around it in various countries, as you know. Uh, in some countries, the health campaigns of the government are broadly accepted, in others, they're broadly rejected. Uh, and part of that has to do with, with whether the people sponsoring the campaign are willing to listen to their publics or whether they only want to talk at their publics. Yeah, and I have HealthCom friends and colleagues who believe that HealthCom invented persuasion and that, you know, they, they, you know, they know everything and everyone else yeah. doesn't understand it. So I think they're very narrow in how they see things. Well, they're very narrow in how they see publics, for sure. Um, they, they, you know, a lot of uh, health communication campaigns sort of demean publics that public should shut up, listen, and do as they're told. Um, and the, the, the assumption that the sponsor of the campaign knows what publics need to know comes through too much. Those are students who should shut up and do what they're told. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, in health communication, uh, there are also elements of public relations. Do you see these two fields you know, overlapping in some ways or learning from each other? Oh, yes. Yes, very much. Um, many public, many health communication campaigns are actually conducted by PR agencies um, or, or the divisions of government that are practicing PR. Um, and, and there they start doing name switching, right? So when governments practice public relations, uh, they don't usually call it public relations. They call it public information, public affairs, uh, public education, but they don't call it public relations, um, at least in the US and in most of Europe that I'm familiar with. Uh, but they, yes, there's a lot of overlap. The other way to look at it is PR people have been trying to do health campaigns forever and have been copying off of health professional health communicators, usually government health communicators. PR people have been copying off of them for 50 years or more. So there's a lot of overlap in those two. And both health communication and PR, many people in them approach their campaigns as marketing campaigns and use marketing communication terminology in carrying out their health campaigns. Okay, thanks. And I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, by the way. I don't think that that's any better than thinking that you already have all the answers. Because in marketing campaigns, you're generally trying to set up an exchange relationship, as I say here, um, for something of value. Uh, so you're trying to sell something um, to in, in marketing campaigns, uh, and you you only have one product. You're not usually very interested in hearing what others have to say about your campaign, uh, and that's a problem with health communication campaigns. But you know, it's also a problem with PR campaigns. Um, and a minute ago we had uh, who was that? Was that April? Someone uh, that that talked about uh, political campaigns. Uh, and of course, political campaigns fall in that the exact same thing uh, as I was just talking about. In political campaigns, um, are a little better than many others in that they listen to publics more. Um, sometimes too much. Sometimes politicians want to tell publics just what they want to hear, what the publics want to hear to try to win their votes. Um, or uh, uh, marketing will do that too sometimes. Uh, so there, there's huge overlap between all of these. And in some respects, the three labels are unimportant, but they, they are very important because oftentimes you will be hired into one of those categories. 
And one of the reasons that I talk a lot about the three uh, core subfields is because once you are in one, that is if you're in PR, marketing communication or health communication, if you're in one of these and you've worked for five or 10 years and, and uh, uh, who is our colleague here from uh, Kiev uh, that uh, worked in an agency in, uh, for a long time. Um, if you have worked in health communication campaigns, you've learned a lot about researching public, uh, understanding how to organize campaigns, presentation of campaigns, evaluation of campaigns, and you can go into marketing communication with those skills as well as into PR with those skills. Um, so these three subfields, these three core subfields for me, you can have a lot of transfer between the fields because they live, all these fields live to conduct communication campaigns. And for that reason, we learn in them, but we learn from practice in them is fairly similar and it can be transferred across fields. I'll, I'll tell you even more, Carl, when, when you're working in PR agency, you can have uh, uh, in the same time, you can do marketing communications and health communications because you know uh, you need money you you need to feed your 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 people so yeah. so you have no Absolutely. choice and i would add in that that in you at the same time you could be doing a political campaign as well sometimes okay anybody else before i move on And may I ask a question? Yeah. And so if a strategic communication is about the flow of information into an organization, if someone studies the rhetoric around an issue, for example, around um, climate change, and uh -huh. studies uh, the rhetoric of different organizations talking about this issue, isn't it considered as a, a PR study? It can be, sure, but it, uh, health, uh, environmental communication can also be health communication, for example. Um, it, it's good that you would bring up the environmental communication. Uh, we have a, a, a very good center on health, on uh, uh, climate change communication at George Mason. Um, and our people do campaigns, uh, study communication campaigns on uh, climate change communication across the US. Um, it's a very skilled area. They're, doing, they're pretty good about using theory. They're pretty good about developing theory, but kind of like happens with marketing and, and with political campaigns a lot um, and various kinds of social development campaigns. Uh, the, we had one of the people on this program, one of the colleagues on this class was talking about doing um, social movements uh, and activism. Um, and, act, and usually those are folks who think they have the right answer and therefore they really don't have to listen to the publics too much. Um, and I wanna put all those together and just say that the best way to practice, whatever it is, health communication, activism, uh, anything, uh, 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 is not to assume that the publics need to know what we know, but to assume that we do not know what the publics need to know. We have to ask them. And the reason for that, and this is especially true in, in uh, the political campaigns have, have uh, people, I'm sorry, doing political campaigns have had a lot of experience in understanding this one point, uh, is that to do a good strategy, we have to first listen to publics because merely repeating what we think we know, which goes on a lot in public health campaigns uh, and even in marketing campaigns. Uh, but, but if we are just repeating what we think we know, uh, the public may not care at all. They may not listen at all. It can be completely what we call waste coverage. It's an investment of time and money in campaigns that nobody listens to. Uh, and it happens all the time. And those are not strategic campaigns. The strategic campaign starts with research and then it builds a plan based on that research. It doesn't build a plan based on what some higher up in government or someone who, who is in uh, health especially thinks they know about what public should be doing. Right. A strategic communicator always begins with what publics are thinking and what they want to hear about. Is that okay for now? Well, I would also add, isn't part of that though, it is what they want to hear about, but it's also what they need to hear about. I mean, we need right. to know what publics know. So that right. But it doesn't, it doesn't start with our understanding what they need to hear about, except in rare emergency situations 
uh, disaster communication, stuff like that, right? Uh, evacuation routes, things like that. But uh, I, there is an element of what they need to know. But that element has to be worked into a campaign that is first sensitive to what publics are thinking and what they want to hear. Otherwise, they will ignore uh, what, uh, what we think they really need to know. Uh, they really, they tend to only be interested in what we think they need to know uh, if we put it in terms or in the context of what it is they want to know. Anyone else for now? Okay, do keep speaking up. This is what we should be doing. Now up here, I put a, a, just some boxes for some of the other kinds of what I build in strategic communication. Um, and so these are kinds of strategic communication that are practiced by other fields. These are not fields that live only to do communication campaigns with the possible exception of social movements. We'll get to that in a minute. So first there's activists, community activists, environmental activists, civil rights organizations, those sorts of things. In Australia, the Aboriginal community um, and, and the movement for that in, in uh, same thing in New Zealand. Um, these, are, uh, these activist campaigns uh, have as their bread and butter, typically, uh, a strategic communication campaign. But they are usually, they usually exist to do something other than conduct the communication campaign. That's why I put them in as a secondary subgroup. Um, again, I would not take personal offense if anybody said it was a primary or a core subgroup. Uh, armed forces have been conducting communication campaigns, strategic campaigns, since the dawn of time. Um, most communication campaigns conducted by the armed forces of any country aren't very strategic because the military organizations are so hierarchical that the people who actually do the campaign have to follow specific orders, usually with specific content that's been approved. And that specific content has to do with particular military needs or political demands of a country or a country's leaders. Um, and it's usually not called strategic communication although sometimes it is. Uh, the US does that a little bit, calls it strategic communication sometimes. Um, they never call it PR. Uh, they do sometimes call it health communication, but they also refer to emergency communication, government communication. Um, and each country, each military that I've had any exposure to sort of has its own term for that division of the military. In the US, for example, it's called public affairs or public information. Right, that's because of the Gillette um, Amendment though. Pardon me? That's because of the Gillette Amendment in the U.S. Yeah, it, it's actually because of a misunderstanding of the Gillette Amendment, but yes. Okay. Um, the, Gillette, the Gillette Amendment, for those of you who, who aren't aware, is uh, it was an amendment to the uh, budget bill of uh, 1917 in the U.S. Congress. Um, and what they, uh, they were afraid in those days of how powerful PR would be. So they wanted to pass a law saying that government money could, uh, could be spent on public relations only if it was appropriated by the government body for use in communication campaigns. That's all that it actually said. Uh, and the, the uh, idea there was that the money would, that you couldn't take government money, tax money, and then run campaigns to meet all kinds of other needs that had to be openly uh, discussed and appropriated to meet those needs. And that became so much of an icon in government in the US that the US folks have um, taken that way farther than the original Gillette Amendment. Uh, and now the military is often afraid to engage in all kinds of conversations because they think it will sound persuasive. And the military prides itself in not being persuasive, at least in democracies, prides itself in not being persuasive. It's a service organization. So they pretend that what they're doing is not persuasive because they don't call it persuasive. Uh, and so they never call it PR, they call it public information or public information. Others at this point? Okay, another whole secondary subfield is charities and fundraising. Uh, and uh, uh, that area has not received enough uh, uh, scholarly attention, by the way, in my opinion, there's a lot to be done on, on campaigns in, in charities and fundraising and stuff. Uh, we had a couple of books uh, in the U.S. written by, um, oh, geez, I just read her name. Who is it did their degree at Florida a bit ago? She was the chair of the, of the Department of Florida for a long time. She just retired a couple of years ago. 
Mm. What are the people in on this conference is, uh, came out of Florida? Kathleen oh, Kelly? Was it Kathleen Kelly? Yeah, yeah Kathleen Kelly, that's right. Um, I don't she know, recently I passed away. Yeah, she just yeah, passed away last night. I think she passed away, yeah. I always uh, respected Kathleen and liked her, and I liked her two books. <clears throat> she always smoked, as far as I can remember. Um, and now, I, I use government communication as separate from armed forces, but it's actually way too big an area. There are all kinds of different current government communication all over the world. So this box should actually be several boxes, but I haven't figured those out. Um, then there's management communication, all of the kind of communication that is used to structure organizations, to coordinate the practices and behaviors within organizations, to coordinate an organization's relations with its external publics. Um, all of that kind of thing is bro broadly a part of management. Um, I've already talked about armed forces. Military is very similar, um, except that sometimes there's communication from the military as a whole instead of from the individual armed forces. <clears throat> Organizational communication is pretty closely related to management communication, but not always. Um, and that has to do with the communication campaigns that organizations conduct, both internal to their organization and external to their organization. We've already talked about political campaigning. And then there's this whole big area of strategic communication that is religious communication. Um, and usually that's persuasive or proselytizing of some sort, although not always. Um, sometimes the religious communication is educational, uh, just educational. It's, it's uh, uh, to, to the flock, if you will, communicating to um, the adherents or members of a particular religion. Um, and then there's all the social movements. And, and I carefully note that that's both left and right. Um, so both the left side of the political scale and the right side of the political scale use that a lot. Carl, can you uh, slide those slides over just a bit? I, I, they're getting cut off on the right-hand side, at least on my screen. Oh, I can't get them over. No, yep, I'm trying. That's good for me. Can you shrink them a little, maybe? I, might I think you can do it on your own screen, Michael. Mine's fine. Yeah, I've been trying, but that's okay. I'll, I'll keep trying. That didn't do any good, did it? <laughs> well, it went full screen, but that's okay. Sorry, you can get is that too big, Joe? No, it looks great to me. Okay. Um, let me see if I can go back and make sure of where we are here. Okay. Okay, so that brings us into the three parts I was going to try to cover today. And it looks like we'll run out of time. But um, the first one is background. And, and I'm going to give you your choice. Uh, we can do probably get in at least one of these and maybe one and a half or so. So these are the three areas that the rest of the slideshow covers. The first one is the background uh, and theory in strategic communication. Um, I'm sorry, background, I got that in there wrong. It's not a, it's supposed to be background of theory in strategic communication. What did I do here? Jeez. Sorry, let me just put back here. I'll get back to it sooner or later. There you go. It's supposed to be background of theory. And so it was about theory. Uh, which begins with paradigms and meta theories, goes to theory, the different levels of theory. So you have formal, informal, lay theories, that sort of thing, uh, and up to formal theories and tested theories. Um, the second category I was whoop, going to do was um, um, the, the people, the groups that we communicate with. So in PR, we usually call them uh, publics. Um, but in, in uh, uh, marketing communication, they're called markets. Um, in uh, most government communication, they're called citizens uh, or something like that. Um, some people refer to customers. Um, in political campaigns, they're voters. But these are the, <clears throat> the groups of people that we communicate with that I said all strategic communication has to start with doing research on. So that's that middle part. And then the third part is the co-operational model that I advocate, uh, which is not particularly crucial to this discussion, uh, but it's there on the slide if you need it. So since we're already moving along on time, I thought what I'd do is just ask your opinion between these first two, uh, what would you like to put a little bit into? My preference would be the theories. Okay. 
That's one. Anybody else? I'm good with that. And if I get a second vote, I'd like to do the co-creational, more around co-creational model. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Don't be taking all the votes. <laughs> Put me down for co-creational model. Okay, that's two. We got another theory too, April sub theory. Okay. And and the, the theory background, the theory discussion is about theory, not about individual PR theories. I don't want to confuse anyone um, because I didn't have time to fit in all of uh, PR theories in one discussion. Also co-creation, the co-creation of model. Okay, Mike, you got to make the final call. What do you want to do? You've heard the people. I need to do co-creation first then theory. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? Yes. Yes. There's all our flavors of theories. We're getting the slides later, right? And this is all about publics here. There's the co-creational paradigm. Actually, I know what we should do probably. We've been going for an hour, so maybe we should take a two or three minute break. How does that sound? Can people get slides later too, Carl? Say again? Can people get the slides later? Can I share them with people? Yes, absolutely. I already said that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, awesome. So let's, let's take about a two or three minute break in case anyone needs it or any pets need it. And we'll start right back up in about two or three minutes. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, Outside of Morning Tail, we're the only person that ever gave anyone a break. <laughs> All right. I figured the slide situation out. I can see them now. <laughs> Michael, could you perhaps provide a little bit of light hold music? Uh, <laughs> I could. No, it's okay. Please don't. It's fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm in the battle with my school to get a new computer. And my current computer has so little memory, I can't have things like music on it. And uh, I empathize with your computer and its lack of brain space. Yeah, it's really messing up my keeping my. Uh, you know, all my other technology up to date, you know, because I can't plug it in and update stuff if I, if I want to, because my computer doesn't have all that crap on it, and then it wants to reset. Just, we're not going to go into it. Let's just say I'm not happy and I'm fighting over it. I got that sense, yes. Bastards. Anybody doing anything good? We got uh, week six coming up and which is a break. Are you on trimesters, Michael? We are, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because for those of us who work in the real world, that was a shameless plug, um, we're in the break between semesters. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I need to do air comments here. We're in that break between semesters when we actually get everything else done that's not teaching. Okay. Well, I'm off from December till June from teaching, so there. Yeah, okay, you win. <laughs> Let's just hope you've got a decent computer by then. Yeah, true. Yeah. And hello, Kate, it's lovely to see you again. Been a long and, time. And you, Anne, I've mm. missed conferencing. Oh, I know, Kim, Kim is here somewhere. She keeps sending me all the... Facebook things of the places that we've been with ICA over the last few years. And it just, it's like, oh, thorns in my heart. I'm, I just miss the travel and the people and the, the connection so very much. Well, next year is ICA, or is it next year in Paris, ICA? Mm -hmm. So we have something to look forward to. Well, you have a word with the government, please, Michael, and, and just make sure they'll let us out by then. Well, well, okay. I suppose if they won't, but if we're going, whether you know whether we have money or not, we're still going. So <laughs> I uh, think you'll, I think you'll find that if you don't pay, they won't let you go. <laughs> well, I'm a life member. That's not a problem with it. Oh, please! <laughs> it's 
it's the getting the school to pay and they're not my school's not paying for shit mm -mm, no nah, not nah, absolutely nothing all right carl's back i might be quiet <laughs> okay so you want to skip to the the, the idea is to we're going to skip to the co-creational co paradigm and uh let me see mike did you want me to shrink this again or something no i gotta figure it out i been it took me an hour but i, I got it reduced on my screen now so i can see it i think it's a person by person thing okay um to start with i call this a paradigm um or a model uh, i don't call it a theory because the theory should have, as a minimum, uh, a statement about the relationship between two or more phenomena, right? So theory should not say this is here or this is here. It should say this and this act this way and you get this result. And a paradigm talks about, uh, another word for paradigm is sort of a worldview. So a paradigm is a kind of meta theory. A paradigm is what we carry around inside us and usually don't question, usually don't think out. They're oftentimes they're the assumptions that we have. And there are some very famous ones of those in history. Uh, and I don't want to take too much time on them, but a couple of them are fun. So the idea of the co-creational paradigm was, was originally introduced by Maureen and I in 2004. And, and again, in 2006, I've done some other papers in that time. Um, and the, the, uh, the book, uh, Strategic Communication Theory and Practice, is based on that model. And several of the chapters in the new handbook of strategic communication uh, that just came out a few months ago uh, is also, are also based on that model, although not all of them. And that includes some of the people on here. I believe, Kim, you have a chapter in there. And Maureen and Michael have chapters. Uh, and I forget who else that's on here might have chapters. Um, in any case, uh, the co-creational paradigm basically, um, see, uh, well, I got to step back for just a moment. There's an underlying paradigm, a set of assumptions. They're not really theoretic. They're sort of a worldview about all of strategic communication. And these, these aren't thought about consciously or spoken out very often, but what they base, well, what they're centered on, and this is true throughout PR, which is my specialty, uh, but it's also true in the other uh, uh, core and, and, and uh, uh, secondary uh, subfields. Um, there, there are a lot of assumptions. And one of those assumptions is that the organization should do the talking and the public should do the listening. Uh, and all you have to do is look at any of the models in any of the textbooks of public relations that I've ever seen. And they all basically have arrows going from the organization to the public. Um, if, if anything comes back from the public to the organization, it's usually a little dotted line that says feedback, uh, implying feedback only about what the organization said in the first place. Um, so there's this underlying paradigm uh, throughout strategic communication that the strategic communicators are the experts, are the people that are going to uh, have the content and know what to say, kind of like we talked about with health communication. Uh, and what the co-creational model says is, the publics are central, not us, not what we're thinking, not what we want. Although what we don't want is very important. We're being paid to do campaigns. There's a reason for that. Uh, when, uh, uh, oh, I just blanked on the name. Uh, not one of our people here today is, uh, what do I do with you? Um, Bob? Uh, Dimitro, Dimitro. Yeah. Um, when Dimitro was working in, a, in an agency and working on campaigns, um, you know, clients pay you to do work. Uh, and so we have to represent them and we have to do those campaigns. Um, and that is one kind of strategic communication. Um, but the best, the smartest of those do research. Uh, and many of the big PR firms require research on campaigns. Um, some of them won't even sign some contracts if the contracts don't include money for research. Uh, in the US, there was an agency, it's still around, it's called Fleischmann Hillier. Uh, and they, oh, 20 years ago, back when I was still teaching at Purdue, uh, way back, um, they already had a standing rule. I talked to the vice president uh, 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 at Fleischmann Hilliard at a conference. And they had a rule back then that unless there was a special reason otherwise, every campaign, every PR campaign that the firm did out of its uh, St. Louis headquarters uh, was supposed to have at least 10% of the budget dedicated to research. And that was close to a quarter century ago that they were doing that. Uh, matter of fact, it's probably more than a quarter century ago now. Um, 
Uh, so, that, so you know, the idea of listing has been there in PR for a long time, but it's not been the central thing uh, for many folks. And so the co-creational paradigm basically says that uh, publics have 90% or so of the decision-making authority. Uh, we can say what we want, but publics decide whether they're going to do it. Uh, and we can say what's, who's the best candidate, uh, what, oh, firecrackers going off outside my window for, there's a weekend, I think there's some vacation day this weekend or something. A lot of fire, so I hope you can't hear them. Um, and that got me off my train of thought, but okay. So, um, research, Maureen might want to look at that slide when, when you get the slides, that's the, this one about the 2004 piece. Maureen, did you know that there was a paper done in Europe and presented at the uh, International Public Relations Research Conference about the reach of our 2004 article? No. Yeah, this was by uh, Finn and Winnie. Oh, how nice. And they found that at that time, back in 2012, it had 138 citations over in Europe, had been used in four books. Three of those were Spanish, one was Dutch, uh, four were German. Anyway, we don't need to do that here today. But, um, so I, I'm referring to, to the co-creational model as a paradigm that's a worldview, that is it's different um, than other assumptions. Uh, let me just sidestep for a second, even though I don't want to take up much time, because, because I want to give an example of what I mean by these assumptive worldviews, the paradigm or the meta theory that we come to our, our studies and our work with. Um, and it's, it's the assumptions that are often blind. That is, we don't think about it. They're often not conscious, but they're there. Um, and, and one of the best ones, and I talk about this in, in the 2018 book is, um, <clears throat> in, in, you've all studied uh, history enough to know that for a long, long time, for thousands of years, human beings uh, lived thinking that the earth was the center of the universe, or at least the center of the solar system. You remember all that? Mm -hmm. The old model. And, it, and, and that was a perfectly logical thing to do, if you stop and think about it. Because every day, someone would wake up, step out of their hut, look up in the sky, and they would see the sun come up on one side, go around and come down on the other side. So it was perfectly logical to think that the sun went around the earth. Um, it was common sense. Uh, and so that was a lay theory. Uh, it was one of those theories that was based on what was thought to be common sense <clears throat> and observation. Uh, and, and, but it was wrong, right? And, and later on, uh, we learned that in fact, the sun was the center of the solar system and that the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. But it took a long time to overcome those assumptions. And that assumption was very powerful and very important. <clears throat> so much so that when people started talking about the earth is the center of the solar system, they got in trouble with the authorities. Uh, the Catholic Church almost offed uh, a couple of the uh, philosophers of the day who talked about uh, the, the possibility that the sun was the center of the universe and the earth merely revolved around the sun with a lot of other planets. Um, so these assumptions have a lot of power. Now they carry a lot of weight uh, and the, the, without us thinking about them. And that's what happens with uh, the paradigms in public relations um, uh, uh, marketing communication, uh, health communication, and all of the other subjects. Uh, we, we come to our practices with a bunch of assumptions um, that don't get questioned enough. Um, and one of those in, in, in strategic communication is the assumption that, if you'll excuse my play on language, that the organization is the center of the strategic communication universe and publics orbit around us. And what I tried to do with, uh, and Maureen and I were trying to do with the co-creational paradigm is to argue a different set of assumptions that the center of the social uh, 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 strategic communication universe is actually the publics. Um, and PR practitioners and our clients are important, but the world doesn't rotate around us. We rotate around our publics, right? That our publics are the center of strategic communication. That doesn't mean we're unimportant. I'm not putting us down. I'm proud of my practice as a PR practitioner. Uh, back when I did that, um, I'm not ashamed of that at all. And in those days, I thought uh, that we were what the public centered, rotated around, and that the, the publics would have to learn to orbit around what we want. Uh, and I practiced that for years. And then I taught it for many years after that. But in retrospect, it was as bad, it was as silly as the view that um, 
the sun revolved around the earth. Um, and it was unquestioned. It was every bit as unquestioned in PR. Um, and so it, it only as we moved through the evolution of public relations theory, and we went from the early straight practitioner one-way communication theories, uh, and we began to evolve a little bit. We got to the uh, symmetrical theories uh, uh, for a number of years, uh, and, and they had a, a question of a balance. So they, they weren't saying that publics had to orbit around um, the PR world, um, but they also weren't saying that the PR world had to orbit around publics. Uh, so for me, the symmetrical theory and, and its adherents were halfway. Uh, they'd overcome the original assumptions um, behind public relations in this case, uh, but they hadn't gone all the way to understanding that um, the who revolves around who is important. Um, and they, they hadn't really changed that yet. So um, you can also think of uh, the co-creational model as a meta theory, if you like, uh, a meta theory one way to use the term meta theory is a meta theory is a theory about how to talk about theories. So if you ever sat down and had an argument with two people about your favorite theory and you had one favorite theory and they had a different favorite theory, actually what you're doing is you're having a meta theoretic discussion. You may not be aware of it, but you're having a meta theoretic discussion about how you should evaluate theories and how which theories you should adopt and which ones you shouldn't. Right? So you have a meta theory about theories. Uh, and this is true of graduate students and faculty. Um, we have all of these assumptions. You can even call them prejudices about what's good in a theory and what isn't. <clears throat> so some theories almost offend us, others we ignore, some we love and we embrace and we take very seriously. Um, and it's the, the standards, the criteria we use for making those decisions. Um, that's one understanding of meta theory. And you, I hope you can see how that ties to what I was just talking about. Uh, with uh, the examples of PR uh, and also the examples of this uh, Earth, uh, the sun revolving around the Earth. Um, move on. Um, and we've already talked about the marketing subfield. So here's the actual co creational model uh, as it has now evolved and is in the book. Uh, and uh, you're absolutely free to disagree with any amount of this you want. Uh, I keep changing it all the time anyway. Um, but it's an attempt to, uh, to display, uh, to, I'm um, sorry, to uh, um, portray, not display, to portray the main elements in the strategic communication uh, relationships uh, that we experience um, and to show by circles versus squares uh, who's in control of which ones and to show by the arrows where lines of influence are and how powerful those lines of influence are. So for me, uh, remember that the PR world for me revolves around publics. Publics are at the center. So I, I have publics as my starting point and their meanings, goals, values, and their view of their relationship with us or our clients. Now, if we're lucky, that's, that influences what we call, this is the, I'm sorry, the circles are where publics are in charge and the squares are where the organization is in charge. Okay, so this is where the organizational influence is and out here is where the public's influence is. And so when the organization begins its research, hopefully it's strategic. And if it is strategic, then it, it takes into account, it starts with what publics are thinking. And, but you notice that line is dashed because many organizations don't start with what the publics are thinking. Many organizations start with what the organization wants. Uh, and this is the, we already know all the answers in health com, for example, or in government uh, communication campaigns. So the, I made this a dashed line, but I'm still playing with that part. Um, so the, uh, in, in this part, this is the campaign planning part. Uh, and you notice this box here, it's supposed to have a bottom line on it that just appeared today. Um, this is the boundary of the PR campaign. The PR campaign is what's contained within this box. Okay. And that's also, by the way, the domain in which we talk about the ethics of public relations or the ethics of marketing communication or the ethics of health communication. Uh, those ethics discussions <clears throat> essentially focus in here. And that's what this whole thing says here. Um, note also that if the, if the 
strategic communicator begins by collecting information about what publics are thinking, feeling, wanting, those sorts of things. If we start with the publics, then we have <clears throat> collected what's called strategic information. And we then can become a valuable source of strategic information outflow into the rest of the organization. So this is where strategic communicators get our influence in organizations, uh, is by our exposure to strategic information that we can then share with the rest of the organization. Likewise, however, the rest of the organization has experiences that they can share with us, and those experiences should influence the campaigns. So we take into account how knowledgeable and experienced the organization is, how creative the individual, the creative talents of the organization are, of the history, uh, the past practices, the reputation, all those kinds of things, all of experience uh, come, but that's all within the organizational context. Uh, okay, and so that's the campaign planning stage. I'm sorry, the uh, campaign research stage, take that back. Um, from the campaign research stage, uh, we move to the campaign planning stage. <clears throat> and this is where uh, campaign planning takes place, that's strategy. So this is where, strategy is created in the strategic communication model, right? The, the publics have valuable information. We have to do strategic research to tap into that information. Then we can use that strategic research for campaign planning. And that campaign planning is the actual strategy. So strategy is a plan. Once that plan is laid, we then have to implement the campaign. And the implementation of the campaign is where tactics come in. So strategic communication campaigns always have tactics, <clears throat> but those tactics should be subordinate to a strategy. And the strategy should be subordinate uh, to research. <clears throat> and that should be subordinate to public. So you see how we no longer have the sun going around the earth. We're trying to now talk about the earth going around the sun. We're trying to reverse our thinking, the traditional thinking in the field. And then this little arrow up here, this little purple arrow, that's the actual campaign. Okay. And that's all we get. That's our only shot in this game is we get to do now what I yeah. Sorry. Oh, man. Something I should know. There we go. We get that's our campaign. So then the publics hear our campaign or receive our campaign, and they may or may not, they, they interpret it in various ways. They don't have to interpret it the way we intended it, and they often don't. Publics are back in charge here, see? This is the only area where strategic communicators have any real control. And even then, we're not in complete control, right? We have to accept the, the, the experience of the organization. We're limited by resources, all kinds of things that go on in here. But this is where strategic communicators do our creative best, and then we apply it through tactics. And then we get this campaign out here, and the publics decide whether they accept or reject that campaign and how they will interpret that campaign. Now, the publics also draw on their original feelings, their meanings, their starting points, um, how they felt about the goals and the values of the organization before the campaign. Campaigns might influence a change. For instance, let's say the, the, the uh, uh, publics originally thought that the organization had bad values or selfish values, right? <clears throat> we do a good campaign and use tactics to implement it. The campaign gets to the publics. The publics may, the publics, in, uh, I'm sorry, where they started influences their interpretation of the campaign. That's why the arrow goes that way. This arrow is also supposed to have another head on it down here. I don't know what I did with that, but um, the, the starting point the public's had influences how they understand or accept campaigns. And you notice that this line, the influence that publics have <clears throat> on how they understand campaigns is actually thicker than this line. So even when we do our communication campaign, this little bitty purple line down here, right? Publics already have more influence on how they're, I'm sorry, are influenced more by what they thought and felt in the beginning than by what we say. So what we say and what we do in our campaigns, our planning and our tactics can never ignore this. It has to be either consistent with it or at least acknowledge it, acknowledge that we understand what the publics were thinking in the first place as we put out our campaign. 
Then after the publics decide whether to accept the campaign, and, and a big part of that is, are they gonna listen or not? Did they just tune you out, right? So the publics make a decision about the campaign. And then this is where co-creation comes in. <clears throat> this is when the publics create, they co-create new meanings, new interpretation, new understanding. Here, they just assess the taking in the campaign, whether they're gonna to listen to it. Here is where they generate new meanings, new understandings. Uh, there's a term I didn't put in the model on purpose, but a very common one, it's called attitude change, right? This is where any attitude change in publics, any behavioral change in publics, any practices in publics is gonna change. And it can be influenced by our campaign, but only if the publics listen to it. Otherwise, there's no bridge to hear it. And when it gets here, publics determine uh, the meaning, the real meaning of the campaign. So we created, we did research, we created a strategy and tactics to implement. We put out our campaign, the publics heard the campaign, and here the publics decide what the campaign needs. Remember the size of this little arrow here. That's our actual communication campaign. And look at the size of this arrow. <clears throat> In my view, this is just a summary, but generally speaking, I think publics will, the meanings that publics co-create about campaigns. So by co-creating, I mean, they start with their original opinions and they take in what we said and did. Now they create, but co-create using both their views and our views, they co-create new meanings. So that's what co-creation means, is that the meaning of a PR campaign, of a marketing campaign, uh, or of a, a, a political campaign or any other kind, the real meaning in the minds of public, they're gonna decide based about 90% on where they started, what their meanings and opinions were when they started, and maybe 10% based on our campaign. Now we could quibble over that, maybe, where they started is 80% or 70% of, the, of their final decision. And our campaigns, if they're really good strategy and real good tactics, maybe we can have a 20% influence. Right? But we're not going to change the entire background thinking and, and maybe even the cultural heritage or the religious heritage of our publics by one skinny little campaign. Particularly not if it does, hasn't begun by understanding where they come from in the first place. So the red arrow here depicts the influence that the public starting point has on their interpretation, their assignment of meaning to our campaigns. Then there should be an assessment or evaluation stage of the campaign. And the output of that goes back to both one, that is publics think about the campaign and they can change their opinion later, or to number two. So, the assessment of the campaign should go back in as research for the next campaign. This is a tradition within PR and STRATCOM where we say we should always evaluate our campaigns. That becomes part of our store of knowledge and we use it for the next campaigns. <clears throat> and that's what this arrow is called. Those go in here. But what's important here is um, that we only get this little shot here at influencing the campaign. The publics get the, these two big red ones, the, this very big, most influential red one, as well as this one, which should be two headings, that's why it's not right. Um, so I know that's a little bit of a convoluted thing, but I'm open to questions on it. We're running, we've been going about uh, to an hour and 20 minutes uh, into the time we originally set for starting. So I don't want to hold you too long, but I am happy to discuss it or answer questions or whatever. Um, can I get, can I go back to uh strategy for a second my you know my advertising colleagues and some of my colleagues who work in agencies have a vision of strategy as sort of this uh metaphor for the campaign that drives the whole campaign and the whole campaign is based around strategy and i don't get that you're describing that and that's not how i describe strategy i'm just wondering okay. if you could take a second on that okay um they're not necessarily in conflict uh, strategy is a plan and to the extent that the practitioners you're talking about have, um, for instance, a, a key theme, a key message, a central message that they use, that they tie everything to, mm -hmm. or they have an image or a symbol or a, a, a mascot or whatever, right? 
These are all elements of a strategy because they are uh, what in political communication, political campaigns, we used to call condensation symbols. And what a condensation symbol is, is it's a, a term, often a slogan or a phrase that we use to summarize a campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're dealing with large numbers of people, you pretty much have to have that tool at some level. So it's a very useful tool to have. But they have to be planned out. They're not accidental. They are a kind of strategy. They're a part of a strategy. Uh, they are a tool, a, a vessel, if you will, that carries our thinking, our plan. That's the strategy. They mm -hmm. carry that. Um, and, and so in a way, I mean, this is a good question you've asked. I haven't thought this part out. In a way, what you're talking about is a tactic, but it's sort of a strategy too. And I'd have to talk about, I'd have to think about where these, what I think of as condensation symbols fit if they're more in three or four. But I don't see a conflict between them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the, the practitioners do them because they've had a lot of experience doing them and they know that's what works. Um, but it works better if the condensation symbol, uh, the slogan, the logo, the phrase, the jingle, the whatever, right? If those things reflect an understanding of where the publics are in their meetings in the first place. If they don't, then they carry no meaning for those publics. They may be very important for the practitioners who think they're important, but if they don't tie into the background of publics, they don't carry much meaning for those publics and they're not gonna get anywhere at helping the publics co-create new ones. Okay, yeah, I, I do this. I mean, I more or less do the same thing. I explain that they're, you know, that they're not mutually exclusive, but they sort of, that what well, strategy is required to make the strategy of the campaign happen. You have, you know, small strategies and pieces that are required to make the, the big strategic idea happen. The big yeah. strategic idea doesn't solve all those problems. It just gives us a direction. And, and then the direction is only useful if it, if that, strategic idea relates to where publics were in the first place. Mm -hmm. right? If it doesn't, you just miss the boat. So there are lots of good strategic things that people come up with uh, that just miss the boat. And there are lots of Mickey Mouse poor campaigns that ring very true with publics. They look genuine, people buy into them. But that's because they started here. And this is why we had one of the folks in this group to, today uh, that was a social activist, talked about social activism. And you know, to the extent that social activism comes out of publics uh, and usually reflects the, you know, the group or the ethnicity or the neighborhood or the nation or whatever that the campaign comes out of, uh, it talks to the meanings and the goals and the values of those publics. Uh, and so if the campaign isn't real slick and if it doesn't have high dollars for production uh, and if it doesn't have really good tactics, it might still be fairly successful because it has, uh, it rings true to those publics. The only, let me just add in, although I'm not prepared to do it much today, but the, this idea of the slogan, the symbol, the jargon, the snippet, the condensation symbol, whatever, those can be, they can be either strategy or tactic. And I would have to think out how I differ, when I differentiate them. <clears throat> They're not automatically one or the other. Um, they can be strategic level thinking. So, and that often happens with political campaign slogans, uh, which, which actually summarize the strategy of a campaign. Uh, that that candidate promises they're going to follow. Uh, and so uh, this goes back to Doris Graber's writing in political communication back in the 70s and 80s of the last century. Um, and she's the one, by the way, who introduced condensation symbols. Um, so the, at that level, those are strategic. Um, but sometimes you have an idea here, a, a, a plan, and you simply come up with a package that you put it in that's a tactic so that it it gets, it's, it's transportable to the publics. Yeah, in yeah. which case, the things we're talking about function more as tactics. And I don't know that I can go any further with that now. I haven't really thought it up. No, I've been trying to articulate it. You know, I've been working on sort of creating a distinction and a hierarchy and some definitions from it. And it is, there is a fluidity between strategies and tactics sometimes, um, which you just have to accept. I mean, you can't easily define them sometimes. And I agree, and I'll go a step further. There always has to be a fluidity between the two, uh, or you can't have a campaign. Kate had a question she had written down. Do you want to um, jump in there, Kate? Oh, oh, thanks, Carl. I found this presentation really fascinating, and I particularly like the way that you're centering the public in strategic communication. Um, mm -hmm. My question was comes back to a comment on one of your slides around critical and cultural approaches being 
more concerned with analysis. Um, and I'd really love to hear I don't your remember actually saying that. Did I say that? Which slide? Um, uh, let me see. I think you said which slide? It was it on the? It was on the CC as meta theory slide. Oh, okay. Um, and I was just really curious, wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Um, was it here? Uh, no, it was CC as meta theory was the name of the slide. It was right before you started discussing everything. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I'm going to waste time doing this. Let me just go ahead and ask your question again. I'm okay, sorry. So I was all right, so the note that I made was that um, some PR research implies a co-creational approach, such as critical and cultural, um, but typically it puts the focus on its own analysis and not on public. This is the bit that I was interested in that you wrote on the slide. So from my perspective, very um, briefly, a critical approach would be concerned with power and a cultural approach would be concerned with meaning making. And I'm... Uh, from my perspective, they are foregrounding both how publics make meaning as well as, um, you know, uh, something about um, the, the capacity of publics to resist. My argument, to resist my argument in the co-creation model is that publics also have power. Yes. So that's what I'd love to hear you talk a bit more about, because I think we're... I, I think there's a lot in your presentation that might overlap with some of those ideas. There, there probably is. Uh, I don't remember what I said on it before, but um, I mean, I, I guess what I'd say off the top is that I, I don't usually use uh, critical cultural terminology, but I agree with your basic definitions of them, mm. um, particularly the critical being power center. Um, so if I was going to try to do a critical cultural explanation of the co-creational model, and I'm not qualified to do that, I've done enough critical cultural work in my time. Um, I guess I could say that uh, from a critical perspective, um, traditional strategic communication, whether it's public relations, marketing, or whatever else, has disempowered the publics and has privileged and foregrounded the organization in what it wants to say. And the co-creational model seeks <coughs> to reverse that. Um, in the other part, uh, I don't know, I'd have to think more about the interpretation part, about the cultural. Uh, mm. To me, cultural is broader than interpretation. It's also, to me, it's a set of frameworks for how we're going to interpret things. And look, I think you did um, point to it in that last slide where you were looking at culture. You, know, you said the need to bring in research, culture, history, relate the public's relationships with the organization past campaigns. To me, that is part of the broader social and cultural context. Okay, I've lost track of that one too. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry, I was trying to pick up some points on your slide, but I agree with you anyway. Yeah. Um, I had thought of doing this from a cultural or, or critical, and I would, given my propensities, because I come out of labor unions and stuff, I'd of course do it from a, uh, a critical perspective, more, my focus would be more critical than cultural. Um, but my concern with organizations was always they had too much power over my fellow employees. <laughs> Um, so I, I think I could probably translate a lot of this into a critical perspective. I'd have a harder time translating it into a cultural, but that's because of my limitations in understanding cultural scholarship, I think. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dima, did you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, in this model, the interaction and communication between publics and organization is limited to the research phase. And after um, implementing the uh, campaign, can we extend this relationship to campaign planning, uh, the implementation of the campaign and the evaluation phase as well? Okay. Can you, yeah, can you repeat that a little slower? I didn't get it all. Sorry. Can we extend the relationship between publics and the organization to other steps as well? like uh, a, a relationship and engagement between the organization and publics in the planning phase, and also the same engagement in the impl implementation phase, oh. and also the oh. same interaction um, in the evaluation phase. 
Yeah, well, the evaluation phase, yes, clearly. <clears throat> um, I suppose if I was going to try to do that, there would be thin arrows from here to here and from here to here mm -hmm. that were double-headed arrows, but that would be just too many arrows in the bottom. <laughs> um, I could see that based on the original research and the experience, both, uh, that campaign planning probably takes into account what the meanings, goals, and values of publics on an ongoing basis and probably would like to check with them. Is that sort of what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, and certainly at the tactical level, that's part of the stuff that Mike brought up. At the tactical level, we're always looking for tactics that someone else has used that worked uh, with publics or with similar publics so that we can try using them. Um, and in a way, that sort of feedback of the publics to the tactics. But generally, I don't think this interacts here. I think it interacts here. We get our feedback here and here. That's what this was supposed to have two heads on the arrow, remember. So publics, if they accept or reject a campaign are telling us something about what they think of the tactics or the strategy. <clears throat> and at the end, when we do assessment and evaluation, we find out again what they thought about the uh, not just the, the uh, 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 strategy and tactics, but specifically about the values reflected in them. That, that didn't answer your question, did it? Uh, yes, but we can also consult with uh, our publics when we are planning the campaign or consult yes. with them when we are implementing the campaign or consult yes. with them about the criteria that we are using to, to evaluate the campaign. Yes, I agree. Did you need me to say more about that? I agree with you. No, thank you. It was I just think. a question. Yeah, I think you're correct. Okay, Mike, anyone else? Uh, nobody's posted, but does anybody else want to follow up on anything? Can I jump oh, in with a question? Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, I think Maureen had partially answered this for me a bit in the chat, but Carl, where do you see the media fitting in here? Because I was thinking about, you know, sometimes they are positioned as just another public, sometimes they're positioned as having a role. Um, certainly in Australia at the moment, we're seeing um, the media kind of create some very different messages around vaccination and they're possibly derailing the public health messages around vaccination. So I was just thinking in terms of the model, where might the media fit? Well, it, it, between three, four, and five, um, and I didn't put uh, media in, but I wasn't ready to at the time, but I also thought it would make it too, too there's already too many pieces and too many arrows. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the the uh, uh, media, you see this little arrow here? The actual campaign? That's where we use media. And that's both social media and traditional media. Right? We can we select amongst the kinds of media we want to use. So it's here. But we also do part of our campaign implementation tactics by, our, uh, uh, by evaluating what kind of media we have available, what we can use, um, how much budget we have, you know, very practical questions like that. Uh, and I think that media probably comes in down here as well. Um, the only one I can think of right now, that's a good question you have, is... Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we always wanted to use traditional media in strategic communication is we want what amounts to the stamp of approval of media. That is, we want the review by an external, supposedly neutral source of media um, so that uh, they will have more influence on how the public feels than if we just said it ourselves, basically. Um, so it, it influences at least three, four, it works at, at three, four, and in the arrow here in the actual campaign. Um, and it also probably influences uh, five, I'm just making this up as I go along, because the media, um, the publics may, be, may accept information in the media that they would not accept if they got directly from us, for example. Uh, by having the media serve as a filter or an arbiter, uh, by what we used to call them here, the imprimatur, imp Jeez, I just screwed that in. Imprimatur, uh, the stamp of approval of the media, of the editorial uh, process in the media. Um, <clears throat> the uh, publics may be much more likely to accept uh, reports in the media than if they got the same report from the corporation. 
I guess I'm also thinking though the media can be quite uncontrolled. So even if we use it as a tactic and put our messages out there through media releases and conferences and all that kind of stuff, um, that the the message we're not guaranteed that that message is actually going to be picked up and appear Absolutely in the media. Correct. So but, but notice that I said that I was talking about the media primarily as a channel, a way to communicate, yep. not talking about the con the content. And I agree with you about the content. Uh, we they are essentially uncontrolled. In fact, I would argue that. Um, publics are going to be more accepting of information the more they think the media controls it instead of us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. But, but that's not necessarily true. For instance, here in the US, we have the culture wars of the left and right after Trump and stuff, right? Uh, and so the media is in disrepute on both the left and the right and to some extent in the center. Uh, and is at its lowest ebb of credibility in the public mind, the last reports I've seen, uh, in modern times. <clears throat> so it's not like the media is, is this impervious, highly credible um, uh, channel for carrying research, for carrying information, I'm sorry. Um, the media itself has credibility problems. Um, and there are some publics that want to hear things from the media and there are some publics that would much sooner hear them directly from the organization uh, without interference from the media. Uh, and so when I grew up, getting your story, I was early in PR, getting your story in the daily newspaper, the big newspaper in town, was the end all and the be all. That was what made your reputation in PR. The more you got front page coverage, uh, editorial coverage, uh, those sorts of things, and we kept our clip, clipping files and stuff, the more you got that, the better a PR practitioner you were, no question about it. Um, and nowadays, I'm much less sure that's true. Nowadays, people want to know how many likes you had on social media. Uh, so I'm not sure which, to what extent the media still has the influence it had. And it's changing fast enough that I think it's going to be shifting under our feet for many more years. I, I just have a question. Um... I'm, um, I'm interviewing some, uh, I have actually interviewed uh, some development professionals in, in India as part of my research. And I am also learning that, you know, there is, uh, I don't know how to say it, but there is something called intermediary uh, publics, you know, people who are working very closely with, you know, with the actual publics. So how can they also play an important role there? Because I am I have interviewed, you know, grassroots workers and, and those people, you know, who are very close to, uh, you know, the actual publics. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a complex one. That, I mean, <clears throat> India is, is sort of a special case, like all ex-colonies, um, where uh, strategic communication organized nationwide campaigns <clears throat> originally were essentially carried out by the colonial governments. Um, and then they got taken over by uh, 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 native governments, by the governments of the country after, after uh, independence. Um, and so while I know some of that happened, I'm not good on knowing to what extent the media is now more or less credible than it ever was in the eyes of those publics. Um, the question I have for you is, uh, do you think that social media is becoming more important for people in India than traditional media when they form their opinions about governments and government practices? Yes, uh, I mean, social media has become important, but uh, you know, there is this problem of uh, fake news mm -hmm. and uh, it has become a really big thing now. You know, we don't know what, uh, you know, what, what is true and what is false. So people are, you know, uh, constantly talking about things which which actually don't exist. So, and, you know, there is so much of, uh, you know, uh, negative campaigning going on. And, you know, the our government is, is you know, is, is, is a right-wing government. So, so they have a huge public relations machinery and they are constantly, uh, you know, coming up with those, you know, fake, uh, media stories and and there is you know this uh, discussion and debate going on you know those fake stories so so it's kind of complex you know uh, we don't know uh, 
uh, what actually the real situation is. Yeah. Um, I think the person that would that's here tonight that would probably be better, or this morning, is probably better qualified than me on that is Maureen Taylor. Uh, Maureen uh, studied uh, and even got a nice award from the government of Malaysia for having some understanding of the relationship between the government and the credibility. And you know, in Malaysia, there's the three subpopulations and stuff. Um, and so a lot of what you're talking about, I think probably has happened in Malaysia. And so I'll step aside for a minute, Maureen, if you have something you want to say. No, not really. Just, uh, you know, Rupesh, we're uh, like, you know, three miles apart uh, when I'm normally in Australia. So we definitely should talk about this. You know, the social media issue, for co-creation, like it is exactly the evidence that co-creation matters. And it's actually the evidence of why it's so horrible, right? So we have treated co-creation as this sort of normative ideal. Uh, we want people engaging and, and sharing ideas, but then when, when it's out of control, like it is across the world right now with misinformation and disinformation and propaganda, we're, we're stuck sort of back. Like we've gone all this way in public relations, strategic communication, and then we see the dark side of it. So it, it has been this last couple of years has just been, well, I would say four years and maybe four months, five months has just been really um, painful to watch how co-creation works and not in the way that we had theorized. Or not in the way we had hoped. We had hoped, exactly. And all theories are right, normative, right? We all have this ideal that, you know, theory, plan, behavior, uh, you know, elaboration, likelihood, right? All of these theories are, are, are normative and ideal. And then when they actually, we see them in action, we say, wait a minute, no, we were kind of wrong on this. You know, there is one topic I want to talk about that is slightly related, but a little bit off, and maybe we're getting too late on this. I recently been reading about behavioral um, insights, BI. I don't know if anybody here has been looking into it, but I recently read an article that said that communication actually has no impact on how people behave, right? That we actually have no idea why people behave, that they, why they behave and how they behave. And that communication is just a cue but there's other factors, internal, economic, all these other things. And I was really distressed that's by- That's circle that. number one. What's that? That's circle number one. Yes, but I, I'm concerned about this, this belief that these companies are putting them, their money into BI, the power of BI, and all these different companies are selling BI on the assumption is we can just test, we can use research to test these little messages and on a hundred people at a time, and then say, yeah, that's the prompt, right? That's the cue that's gonna get people to act. So I'm just a little bit more concerned about that now. Yeah, I agree. And it, 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 unfortunately, I mean, it's a, it's a, a technique that has been being used in uh, advertise, product advertising forever. Um, right. Where they, where they have, you know, they, they've had that naive Hello. belief. Michael King, uh, this hand I'm going to go through is- Sorry. Trying to open uh, and uh, Gianni has a great question about whether or not uh, the co-creational model is linear or iterative, and I'm going to let my advisor answer that. But mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't figured it out yet. Um, <clears throat> I get I, if I'm understanding the terms correctly. I guess my little to one and two here, which suggests that assessment evaluation is done by publics. An assessment evaluation is done by the organization, um, which suggests it's iterative. Is that what you meant by iterative? I think so, yeah. And that, you know, certain changes and events and activities can punctuate and change something that was moving along this direction or vector, and then all of a sudden changes to another. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, also, this model very well explains um, the um, P, uh, like developing a, a PR campaign in a traditional organization. But the activist groups that I'm working with, and they are they are very informal groups. They don't have a formal organization. They don't have the resources to do research. So what they do is that they ask their publics to join them, be one of them and then uh, participate in um, 
their meetings uh, for strategizing, for planning, for um, implementing campaign and everything. So this is the way that they're operating to develop their campaigns. Uh, I'll try to respond to that, but let me first uh, just point out one of the terms you used uh, was the, or one of the phrases you used was that they didn't have the resources to do research. Uh, one of the things we didn't have time to get into tonight is there's all kinds of research. Um, and, and so we don't want to use the same term to apply to informal research that we've done in our lives and that we just call experience versus um, focus groups versus questionnaires and surveys and running statistics on them. Uh, that's all research. And that organization does have the ability to do research. It does so with its members' experience. It does so by, as you're saying, bringing people in, uh, getting them to participate. That's a kind of research. That's all legit. Um, and then uh, that is, uh, from the point of view of that, that organization, that's strategic research. Uh, and that helps the organization form um, its uh, goals and its values uh, and its grand strategy. So I, you know, I think that those kinds of organizations, which is where I started, as I said, um, actually pretty much do all of the things that big organizations do. They do them on a smaller budget and we use different terms um, for them. But they go, they pretty much go through all the same processes. Uh, when we were sitting around um, way, way back in the 60s, I was part of, of starting a small newspaper uh, <clears throat> that was very environmental, um, social community, uh, in those days, anti-Vietnam War and stuff, but it was a, a small little newspaper. Um, and we didn't have any idea where we were going when we started that. So we started by every, this is gonna sound terrible, but you know, what we did was we had a house. And so we just kind of opened the door on Friday evenings and invited people in. Uh, and we would have beer. This was quarts of beer, by the way, not just a little beer, but a quart of beer. Uh, and just talk with folks from the neighborhood. Some of whom agreed with us, some didn't, and whatever. But that's how we learn um, what we should or shouldn't try to be trying to do. Uh, and now that I look back on it, that was pretty good research. But Shima, did I does that actually respond to what you said, or did I miss? Yes, yes. By um, broadly defining research as any kind of uh, activity that we can get inside well, any, from anything our that we take anything. It's research if it investigates how or why people function, what their values are, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then we use that to adjust our own behaviors. Right? Then it served as research for us. It doesn't have to be formal research. It doesn't yep. have to have a label research on it to be research. Yep. Much of what we call common sense and a lot of what we call experience are kinds of research. And if you can drink beer while you're doing it, that makes it better. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in those days, there were ports. Nobody buys ports. <laughs> Can't afford that here. Oh, well, that's an idea. Actually, I used to like uh, VB, Victoria Bitters. It's still here. <laughs> what was the one with Triple X? Was there one that was a Triple X? Yeah, triple X. Four, yeah. I think it's 4X, actually. Four. I think he's pandering to the Australians in the crowd. I don't see it much here. I see we have. The, oh, that's it's right. Triple X is, the, is a Mexican beer. Mm. Yeah, well, Dos X is. is is two X. So may had a question too, Carl. I don't know if you've got the chat, um, or so may have you got uh, audio? Do you want to ask it? Uh, may um, and there's also one by Noor as well. Okay. I'm not sure if sume has got her audio because I think she's just Can phoning I? in. Um, her question was on the issue of behavioural insights, do you think due to distrust in communication from the government or entities who should be trusted by publics, communication might not have influence on pub public behaviours and publics think and feel that they should behave how they want to behave because they've lost trust? I think that's uh, pretty much exactly what Maureen was talking about. Um, that's a very big concern. I mean, certainly here in the US, that's become an issue. Um, now, I think it always was an issue, but now everyone's admitting it was an issue. Um, and I think that uh, I also agree with uh, Maureen's comments that the uh, uh, social media has kind of brought that to the fore in some respects too. Um, 
but I don't think that that's unique in human history by any means. I think that you know, seeking, uh, dreaming that there's a time when all these channel, these kinds of communication can be trusted uh, and have they have real authority in our lives. That sounds too much like the Middle Ages and the Catholic Church to me. Um, it sounds a lot like uh, obedience to authority. Um, so I actually sooner have some level of distrust. Uh, so that we question institutions, we question old, old ways of doing things, but we never do so on the assumption that we know more than the people involved in doing them. We still have to go out to the publics first. Um, exactly. this, this does not mean that our campaigns are unimportant. It just means that strategic communication doesn't start with the campaign ever. It starts with the publics always. Okay, and Gianni had a question. Do you wanna ask that? Um, thank you. I think Maureen has quite addressed it quite well, and I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm just curious if the steps two to four and uh, including one could be in some way um, could be done ir irrit uh, it iteratively. Yeah, iteratively. Yeah. Um, yeah, because considering uh, the social media things. Uh, nowadays, you know, social movements and uh, especially hashtag movements could happen at any moment during the uh, the PR campaigns. So I think that it would be worthwhile taking uh, certain changes and uh, social movements into consideration. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, I agree. Um, <clears throat> and some social movements, they don't have any choice but to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. So here in the US, for example, where companies, corporations, those selling openly on the public market, uh, always, always avoided any discussion of race, gender, any of those kinds of questions. Now, all of a sudden, all of them can't get out there quick enough. Uh, and they're stepping all over each other to try to prove that to them, Black Lives Matter, for example. Um, so we've seen these big shifts. Um, and again, Part of that is you know, a rejection of some of the things that governments have said, whether it's Trump or somebody else. Um, part of it is a rejection of various kinds of authority. Um, but part of it is a healthy questioning of those things too. And sometimes we have to you know, not assume that rejecting these things is bad. Sometimes rejecting is good. Uh, and how this is all gonna pan out, uh, we have to wait and see. I think it's gonna be a fraught few years, decade or two, um, where a lot of things are changing and a lot of previously accepted ideas and authorities are being questioned. I think that's, that's being seen in, in religions around the world and governments around the world. Um, we're in an interesting phase of that and social media plays a role, but it's like that big a role. It's not social media that's doing this all. Uh, it's government behaviors, it's uh, educational level of the people. Uh, there's just a whole lot of things. Uh, and that's gonna continue to, to, to put us in a position where in my view, strategic communication campaigns are gonna be more and more and more important uh, every year uh, for the next 10 or 20 years or for probably the lifetime of some of the folks here, certainly for my lifetime, uh, but maybe for some of the other folks here as well. Um, Maureen had, well, I was gonna make a comment earlier and then we had a couple of the questions then I thought, I think it's 10 o'clock there for you. We should probably wrap it up after this. I don't know, it's up to you, but Maureen, you wanna, earlier you started saying something. Oh, what, I'm trying to think about which comment. Actually, I'll just answer uh, Shima's. So okay. Shima said, uh, do we need to decide who our publics are, including who and excluding who? And the answer old school would be, we listen to those who agree with us, right? And so we build alliances and networks of them. But I'm recently really into this idea of social movements and activists as the canary in the coal mine, which is that they used to bring down a bird and the bird would pass out from lack of oxygen. And then the coal miners would know that it was no longer safe to be working in this part of the mine shaft and would have to get out. And I really wanna argue that those who disagree with us, no matter how much we don't wanna listen, we really do. Because even in their hatred or even in their criticism of our values, there is this, uh, this idea of something that we, we need to address, like there is, an objection is a question that has not been answered. So Shima, my answer is, 
we, we should not exclude those who disagree with us. We should listen to them. We can agree to disagree, which goes back to Michael's dialogic work that we do, right? It's not a, a zero sum game. It's a long-term relationship. Societal life is not just uh, a decision and it's done. There's negotiation in the co-creation of meaning. So as much as it hurts, and trust me, I've been a, a director of a school. <laughs> I've had people who totally disagreed with me and it would have been really easy to say, I don't, I don't wanna listen to you. But truly there is something when people disagree that we can learn about why they differ, why they, why they argue, why they disagree with us on these values or assumptions. And I, I think that the future of teaching the next generation of public relations, strategic communication people is the ability to facilitate that discussion and feed that, uh, those ideas forward to the organization. So we used to talk about boundary spanners that public relations serve the boundary spanning role, right? And I love that, right? It was a really great way of explaining how we sit in the organization as well as outside of it. But I actually think the future of strategic communication based on co-creation is the idea that we listen and we, we interact and we respond and that we treat the publics and there's so many of them and we really listen to them. And we treat them as the canaries in the coal mine. And so do we exclude people that we don't like? No, unfortunately, we have to listen to them because what we have not been able to persuade them to share our point of view. And that means that our point of view isn't clear enough or isn't persuasive enough or maybe needs to be revised. May. Thank you. Uh, you had a question. Did you want to jump in with that? And then I think uh, maybe you can. Uh, can I ask you a question, Carl, about, uh, look, in practical public relations, when we are planning the campaign, so and we are doing research, we are, we are trying to segment our publics. And if we are doing this properly, if we, we've segmented a lot of publics, like multi, uh, so myriad of, of publics. So again, when you come to the client and you say, well, we have limited resources, so let's focus on these two or three publics, that's it, we can do it. Having uh, said that, from the perspective of, of uh, this co-creational paradigm, when, when you say, if, if we want to put the public in the center of, of, of our communication, of, like a, as a core, so, so how we can uh, not communicate with other publics, which we take, say, it's not so important for us. Okay, um, two, two part response. First, I call this the diet. Can you see, Mike, is this up on the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, I call this the co-creational molecule. So this is the smallest depiction you can have of a co-creational relationship. You can't get smaller and still have it be a co-creational relationship. Okay. Um, and you note that I talked about here and here and elsewhere, I always use the plural of publics. So in answer to your question, <clears throat> this model could be applied to one or many publics. When you apply it to many publics, you would have a whole lot of number one circles out here. Right? And it gets very complex. Remember, this is just a molecule. It's just depicting the smallest unit of one relationship. So the, the, the um, having multiple publics would have several sources of information here. Then the big challenge comes with which ones, because uh, they may disagree, uh, <clears throat> which ones are we going to listen to? Is that what you're asking? To me, exactly. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. Um, and I haven't gotten to that yet, to be honest. Um, we, you know, the, some of it we can do based on our experiences. Um, so we know that some in, some publics tend to be uh, tend to influence other publics. Um, so, for instance, out of marketing, we learned a long time ago that children influence parents' purchasing behavior, and that's why a lot of advertising that's out there is aimed at kids, especially fast food restaurants and stuff like that. So we we already know some things about the relationships between these publics, but you raise a very good issue that I didn't cover in the molecule. Uh, and if I was going to try to expand this into a broader system, uh, I would have to address better 
<clears throat> the question you just asked. And I'm not sure how I would do that. <clears throat> um, another way of wording it is strategic research can have several arrows coming into it. And they're not all of equal weight or equal importance. And so we have to learn to choose, we have to learn to identify the ones that are most crucial uh, to good campaigns. And the most important, the, the most effective way of doing that is today, today is you find the few things that several of them agree on and you address that as the strategy. Right. And what part of your strategy? No, I, I, usually, I usually tell people that, that we're not doing one campaign. So uh, I'm usually tell my clients that we are doing the campaign with this public and the campaign with this public. So simultaneously, we're, we're doing dozens of campaigns. Sometimes the event is a similar for, for several campaigns in, yeah. in the same time. But, but anyway, I, you should treat it like a, a separate campaign. So your, your relationship with this specific problem. I agree with you that, uh, but, but see, we, we can't do an unlimited number of campaigns because most of those campaigns aren't going to be useful to most of our publics mm -hmm. if we do too many. So we are still in the old problem that PR and marketing have faced all along is what do we say and to who? And some of that is what we used to call waste coverage. That is, we're putting out, uh, we're kind of developing strategies and tactics for communicating to publics and it's a waste coverage. We've put out stuff we don't need or stuff that counteracts. It's even negative uh, to the impact of our other messages. So when we start having multiple publics in the model, it becomes much more complex. <clears throat> and I would have to put considerably more thought into it, I have to admit. Okay, so Prue had had a question a little while back where she asked about uh, under the model, your, the co-creation model, what would count as a strategic communication campaign? What's your take on that? Prue, did you want to? Um, I guess I was kind of thinking in terms of measurement and evaluation, because you've got that number seven there. Um, under the co-creational model, what counts as an effective campaign? Because, I mean, traditionally, we haven't been particularly good at measurement and evaluation in PR, I don't think, anyway. But often we would have said, you know, if our, if our publics recall or identify with at the key messages we put out in the campaign, then we would call that as a success. Yeah. Under this model, when they can co-create their own meaning, you know, if they have a different meaning than what we intended, where, where does the kind of effectiveness uh, in, fit into it? In, in this model, uh, it had, there are several components that go into that assessment. <clears throat> so things like message understanding, comprehension, and message recall are over here. <clears throat> and assessing whether the public's heard, understood, uh, key messages, recall, uh, those sorts of things, that would be important even in this model. But for us, for me, that's only important because of the meetings that are co-created. In other words, I just have an arrow here. I don't have an arrow from here. Right? So for me, it's the new meetings that are co-created that's important. I suppose I could make or that you could make the argument that um, a campaign that people understand and can recall is likely to have more impact here than one that they don't recall key messages in. But for me, it's the new meanings they come out of that come out of that process, the co-created by the public. That's the key thing. So maybe I should be thinking about more than one arrow into assessment. But I'm not sure. Because for me, the focus still needs to be on co-creation. It's called a co-creational molecule for a reason. Uh, and I would still keep my focus on co-creation. If the public's had an entirely different point of view about a particular issue or behaviour or something than what you had put out in your communications campaign or your strategic communication campaign, would you then say that is um, that has been ineffective as a campaign? Probably, but not absolutely. There are times when just finding out that, see, this is one molecule. There are molecules before it and molecules after. Right? So... Um, Ideally, they would have, there would have been other campaigns back here where we found out if publics were understanding things but co-creating uh, contrary meetings. Mm -hmm. And sometimes- sort of what you're asking. And I could see that fitting in here. Sometimes, 
you're not necessarily engaging in your messaging because it's what you know like we're not pandering to the publics i mean sometimes we have a we have to bring a position to the public that they have to think about and we might not completely achieve our goal but that doesn't mean because the public disagrees we're wrong so that also you know is, a, is part of the decision about success and that's especially true on some public health and emergency campaigns and stuff like that <clears throat> unfortunately uh the people in political campaigns think the same way and that's why they keep saying the same stuff <clears throat> and it would help if they learn more from the public Okay, we're going to do one more question because I think it's we've got like Kim. You have the you have the floor for the last question. You want to add, you mentioned uh, something about peer influence. You want to ask that now? I think Kim left. Really? Well, then we won't ask Kim's question. Does anybody else want to ask the last question? I actually want to follow up on um, Bruce's question about um, if the actual message, the intention of that campaign is not communicated to the public. And actually in the end, they created another meaning. And I was thinking about, for example, Pepsi's um, campaign, like after the, I think it's the, um, giving the police officers a can of coke and corrected oh, their yeah. racism yeah. issue. And I think the campaign, their intention is to engage in the uh, racism discussion and to hopefully the, the whole society will realize the problem of racism and to, uh, for everybody to engage in this issue. And I think the public or the counter public uh, changed the whole narrative of the campaign and everybody became anti Pepsi, but their new meaning is actually pro you know, uh, the, the anti uh, racism thing. So, I mean, in the end, if we, we consider from the co-creation model, their campaign is actually successful because it, it actually contributes to the uh, societal discussion about racism, right? Yeah, well, new, new meanings were co-created that weren't the ones that Pepsi wanted, but they led us through assessment to new campaigns, new understandings of public. So in that sense, they were okay. But let me, let me, I'll just give you my take on that particular campaign. They didn't do enough with number one. They didn't think enough about what the publics were thinking and they didn't do enough strategic research. They had one of the Kardashians or something carrying this can of Pepsi and they were banking on the, the identity, the popularity of a Kardashian and the idea of peace with military or something as carrying their meaning. So they tried to come up with a good strategy, but they hadn't done enough down here and over here. Uh, and that's why they missed. Now we're all always going to miss some. There's no such thing as doing perfect research. So the question is, you know, did they miss by too big? And I think they did. They, for their use, they wasted millions of dollars, millions and millions and millions of dollars went up in smoke. And that was their decision to think they could come up with a strategy without first evaluate, first investigating, finding out what publics are thinking, what their values are. They needed to do a better job of understanding publics. Agreed, and that's an argument for why there has to be diversity in the advertising sector, the marketing sector, and the public relations sector. Because if you had enough African Americans <laughs> around that table or people of diverse backgrounds, they would have said no. Yeah. No, and not at group all. Think. That's a classic example of group think where you got a bunch of white guys sitting around the table who decided yeah. they'll love this. Yep. She'll take exactly off that right. wig. Exactly, exactly. But, but you know, all of that comes from the model which says that publics revolve around us. Mm -hmm. And it all comes from the original old model of we're the center of the universe and we're just not. Okay, okay. Carl, you want to get in your last, uh, last statement or anything? We'll wrap it up. No, I think I'm pretty well wrapped up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I appreciate your time. It's late and uh, I appreciate you being here for this. It was a great talk. I think everybody enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. And Thank I'll see you. everybody next month. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.